You ready? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's get started. Um, pleasure to have with us today, today, Jason Brennan from Georgetown. And this talk to tell us about the bad news, about the good news, about both. Oh, thanks, thanks for joining us. All right, absolutely. Thanks for having me here. It's nice to be out here at UT Austin again. It's been a while since I've, I've been on campus. Can't remember how long, but, but quite a while. Um, I'm going to talk to you all. So this is a paper that Chris and I have under review. It's just it just went through like the second round of revisions. We're kind of waiting on it. So we're still in a position to revise it. Um, and you can help me with that too if you can find some big holes in it or tell me what we should do. And basically, this is a paper about in the past few years, especially like really over the past ten years, there's been sort of a new kind of triumphalism about voting, where people are like, you know, back in the day when I was taking classes on voting behavior and like how to calculate the probability that a vote would be decisive. I was taught that the chances that your vote will make a difference are vanishingly small. They're basically on par with uh, the probability that I'll spontaneously quantum tunnel through this floor and appear on the other side. They're like that low. But over the past few years, thanks to work by Edlin, Gelman, and Kaplan, and a few others, there's been a view that maybe the chances of breaking a tie in a major election are significantly higher than we thought. You know, maybe it's more like for people in Pennsylvania, like one out of 10 million as opposed to like one out of like 100 trillion or one out of one times 10 to the you know, 2600 or some crazy low number like that. So people, because of that, have been arguing that actually it turns out that voting is a form of effective altruism. It's a good use of your time and your energy is to go and vote. So this is basically what the paper is going to be. Uh, William McGaskill, Robert Woodland, and a few others say, voting, it's like donating thousands of dollars to charity. And my reaction is maybe, is it though? Because in fact, basically what I think is the problem is this. Uh, it used to be people thought 20 years ago, votes never make any difference. They're just, the chances of voting making a difference are so small that the expected utility or disutility of a vote is basically zero. You know, and should be treated as such. However, if votes actually have a high chance of making a difference, then we have to treat them as if they're serious. And it turns out that the people who are writing about this, there's been a bunch of papers published in political science and philosophy arguing that votes, voting is a really great thing to do that's really helpful. They're not kind of taking their own standards seriously. So this paper kind of takes them to task for that and all the mistakes that they make in applying their standards. Effective altruists advocate voting, but they drop all the rest of their effective altruist apparatus when they think about voting. All right, so that's the background. I'll give you some more details as we go. So, all right, here is Edlin, Gelman, and Kaplan. They have a new model trying to calculate the probability that the vote would be decisive. When I was in college, I was taught, you think of a voter as being like a coin flip or a coin toss, and you model voters accordingly. Asking what the probability is that your vote will make a difference is like asking, if I have a coin that's, say, weighted 60% towards heads and 40% towards tails, and I flip it 210 million times or 120 million times, what's the probability it will come up exactly 50-50 heads and tails, and then you get to break the tie? With a weighted coin, obviously, it's going to be really, really small. There's a couple other variables that make it small as well. However, now, because of Edlin, Gelman, and Kaplan, they say these models can't be correct, right? These binomial models of calculating the probability of a vote being decisive can't be right because if they were correct, elections would not be as close as we see them, as often as we see them. So they say, statistically speaking, that can't be right. So they try to come up with a new model that uses, well, I don't get into the details of it, I'll just give you the broad overview, uses a different way of calculating this where they try to estimate, given the closeness of elections, what the probability of a vote being decisive is. Now, in the United States, because of the Electoral College, of course, some votes matter more than others. Like, for instance, how many of you are from Texas? <laughs> yeah, many of you, you know, figured. So your votes matter less than mine because I live in Virginia. Right. So the chances on their model of my breaking is higher, significantly higher than yours. Your, their model basically says people from Texas have like an arbitrarily low chance of uh, breaking a tie and ever changing their outcome of a presidential election. But they thought, like this is what Gelman posted uh, on the Economist website right before the night of the 2020 election. He thought, given his model, um, people in Pennsylvania had like about a 1 in 8.8 .8 million chance of deciding the election. People in Michigan, a 1 in 15 million. Arizona, 1 in 21 million and so on. And these are still really low numbers, right? Yes. Should we be thinking about this as like presidential voting only, or should we be thinking of it given a uh, like, you know, state house of representatives like one goal or, or smaller? It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, you're right. The, the papers that they published on this, uh, they mostly talk about presidential voting, but they would end up saying, like, yeah, in a state run of a statewide election, your chances might be significantly higher, but then also the value of the election will be lower. Right. So we're gonna get to like an, I'll give you an expected utility equation, very simple one in a moment. But of course, the big variables are going to be, what's the value of the election electoral outcome discounted by the chances that you're going to be decisive? The bigger the stakes, the bigger the, 
party outcome is, but then, you know, you, if you're in a smaller election, your vote will have a higher chance of being decisive, but your, the thing that you're discounting is smaller too, right? So yes, so they mostly write about presidential elections, but you can kind of see how this would go, right? So if these numbers are that high, these are pretty low numbers, but then isn't a presidential election pretty high stakes? Couldn't we say something like, you know, hey, maybe maybe Biden is worth a trillion dollars more than Trump or vice versa. Maybe maybe Clinton is like two trillion dollars better than uh, than Trump was or something. So if these are such high stake elections, then discounting trillions of dollars by you know one over 38 million, that's still a pretty good use of your time. And so a bunch of papers have been written and published in books and other things arguing that for many voters, Casting a vote is like donating thousands of dollars to charity. So Edlin Gelman and Catherine say, at $50,000 per half hour, voting is surely one of the best and most efficient charities around for a voter in New Mexico. Um, Will McGaskill, who runs the Effective Altruist Institute at Oxford, in his book um, on how to be an effective altruist, says, voting is like donating thousands of dollars to caveat, developed world charities, it's a much better use of your time than you could get by, say, working the hour takes you to vote and to donate your earnings. So they're like, yay. Yes, go ahead. So I don't know this for sure at all. So they're, they're, when they're using this calculation, are they just assuming that you're making a good decision when you vote? Is that like, yeah. that seems like philosophically incoherent. Yeah. People are making them wrong. Absolutely, and that's part of what my critique okay. is going to be. Yeah, it's like the oh, weird thing. I mean, to sort of summarize this whole paper, it's like this is this is how Bill McGaskill thinks. You're considering donating hundred dollars to charity. He's like, hold on, don't just give it to any random charity. You should recognize some charities may cause a lot of harm. Some charities do nothing, and some charities are a lot of good. So, like giving it to Scared Straight is a disaster. Every dollar you give them costs two hundred dollars of social harm. Giving it to the Red Cross. It's, it's basically like throwing the money away. The Red Cross does a lot of good, but they're so high on their margin, on their uh, diminishing marginal returns curve that like $100 does nothing. And then giving it to other charities like Deworm the World Initiative, every dollar you give them, you're going to do $20 worth of good, right? Be careful. Don't just give your money away. And don't just guesstimate. Like, really look into it. We can help you with that, what it takes to donate. And then when you're like, okay, great. What about voting? You're like, ah, just guesstimate. Pick the thing you think is better. Um, and they can't say that they're being inconsistent. So really, all this paper is, and it's hard as being like, let me show you just how inconsistent they are and how thorough your inconsistency is. So that's where I'm coming. Like the bad news is, if votes matter in the sense that they have a pretty significant chance of making a difference, such that their expected utility might be pretty high, well then their expected disutility might be high. It means voting is like a risky activity that can do a lot of harm. Voting could be like donating $50,000 to charity or destroying $50,000 or causing $50,000 of social loss. And further, we're gonna argue, empirically speaking, most voters have no clue. They are not in a position to know whether they are making the good donation or the weird anti-donation. So we're gonna argue that rather than recommending voting, what you should do if you're an effective altruist and you believe in the Edmund Gelman Kaplan model, the probability of a vote being decisive, is recommend overwhelmingly for most people a high degree of moral caution and abstention. Rather than this being a celebratory thing that implies everyone should vote, you should be like, oh crap, voting is a really risky activity. You gotta be really, really careful. And it's weird that they don't say this because they really are like, oh, you're thinking about donating $100 to charity? Hold on. But then you're like, you're thinking about voting? Oh, well, just vote the way you feel feels good. So let me give you some more detail about this before I get to the critique. Basically, the, the, the very simple kind of um, equation you're going to use for calculating the probability of a vote being decisive on this model is this. You know, it's going to be the expected utility of a particular vote is the difference in the value between two candidates. Whatever the expected difference is in the value between two candidates, discounted by the probability of your vote being decisive, minus your opportunity cost in voting. All right. So those are the basic parameters. You know, PD here is the probability your vote will be decisive. When I was in college, I was taught like, oh, it's using a binomial model, the probably my vote will make a difference is like, you know, in say Massachusetts would be like one times 10 to the negative 2000, just vanishingly small, right? But they don't think that's right anymore. Delta C here is supposed to be like the difference in the value between the two candidates. And one of the big questions is gonna be, how do you assign a value to that? Where does that number come from? Do you actually know which direction it goes? And uh, CO here is like your opportunity cost. So really the debate here has mostly been about with like Edmund Gelman and Kaplan and others who've written on this recently has been that parameter P over PD, the probability of your vote being decisive is much higher than people thought 20 years ago. Binomial models are mistaken. We should increase that by quite a bit. So there we go. Um, 
I'm going to skip over this part, but you know, and I'll skip this part too. I have some worries about using expected utility calculations in general, but for the sake of argument, I'm just going to grant them that. So here's the issue though, is now they're arguing that the probability it will be decisive is significantly higher than people thought, which means, you know, say 20 years ago, everyone was taught the expected utility of an individual vote in any major election is going to be approximately zero. You know, it might be approaching it from the negative side to the positive side, but it's going to be approximately zero because the probability of being decisive is so small that it's going to discount this, right? And then your opportunity cost is always like something. You'd watch Netflix or something, so it's not worth voting. But they're arguing, no, no, the expected utility is high because the probability being decisive is sufficiently high. But if that's true, then we have to think of voting as a risky behavior. So Blumaski and Brennan, who are one of the people, not me, not Jeff Brennan, who I'm not related to, which often disappoints people, they're often like, oh, Jeff, Jay Brennan, he must be like your grandson, right? right? We're not, because we work on the same stuff, and people are just talking about that. But Lebowski and Brennan, in a previous book on this topic, some articles on this topic, say, you know, vote has to be discounted not only by the probability of being decisive, but additionally by the probability that you've overestimated or even reversed the respective merits of the candidates. McGaskill says, if you're uncertain about which party is really better, you might reasonably think it's an overestimate, and your expected value of voting would be lower due to the chance of voting for the worst party. If you're completely unsure which party is better, the value drops to zero. But the problem with McGaskill here is he ends up treating the certainty here as kind of a subjective valuation in a way that he shouldn't. And that's why his advice about voting doesn't really make sense. So here's kind of one of our metaphors for what's really going on. Imagine the following is true. On the other side of the state, maybe this doesn't work so well for Texas because it's such a big, big state. Um, you know, we live on the East Coast. On the other side of the state, there are two buttons. Back in the day, we used to think that pressing these buttons basically did nothing. But we recently discovered that that's not true. It turns out if you push the burgundy button, that will donate $3,000 to an orphanage. It also turns out that if you instead push the maroon button, that will destroy $3,000 of the orphanage's funds. Should you drive over and press the burgundy, the maroon button, or the burgundy button, that's the good one. Should you go across, would you recommend the people, now that you know that these buttons actually do something, that they drive across the state and show up and start pressing the buttons? Well, that will depend upon your thinking of how good they are at discerning which one is maroon and which one is burgundy. I made this slide, and I don't know which is which. I've already forgotten, right? I Googled maroon and burgundy on Google. I took the first like color graphic that came up, and I stuck them here, and I don't know which is which. Right? I'm not sure. I want to say that voters are kind of in this position. Sure, we can prove now that we know these these buttons do something. We know one of them kind of makes the world better, and one makes the world worse. But if we want to recommend that people to be effective altruists and actually push something, we need to know how likely it is they're going to pick the better one over the worse one. What if we add the following? Suppose the following facts were true of human beings who are considering pressing these buttons. Imagine that we have very strong evidence that most people who think they can discuss, they can discern the difference between the colors and identify which color is which can't. They believe that they can, but they're wrong. Suppose we knew that about most people. Imagine, by the way, that some people think themselves exceptions to this rule. They're like, yeah, yes, I understand that most people cannot distinguish burgundy from maroon reliably. However, I'm really good at color theory and I'm very good at discerning it, right? You know, you're, you're like wearing like a, I actually don't know if it's burgundy or maroon, but maybe, you know, maybe you know that you're like wearing like dress that's like one of these colors, right? <laughs> but it turns out that even people, and like your shirt too, right? Like it turns out people like you who maybe do know these colors, who think you're exceptions to the rule, that turns out to be unexceptional. Believing yourself exceptional is completely normal. Imagine that people who think themselves competent usually are not, and imagine it actually gets worse. Imagine we have pretty good evidence that people tend to sort themselves into social groups, where to fit in with my social group, we're always like, that's burgundy, and the other group's like, that's maroon. And we routinely identify things as being certain colors because we get social rewards for doing so, regardless of the reliability of our decision making. If we knew all that about human beings, they had this weird psychological quirks, we probably wouldn't go around being like, hey, everybody, go press buttons. Instead, we'd be like, oh, crap, you know what? Don't touch the buttons. It's really risky. You should be careful. But effectively, that's what's going on with voters. We can think of voting as being a little bit like this and voters as being like that. And if that's the case, we shouldn't be recommending everyone just go vote their conscience. We should be be proper effective altruists about it and saying it's a really risky endeavor. You probably don't know what you're doing. If you think you know what you're doing, you're probably wrong. If you think you're exceptional, you're probably wrong. If you think it's easy to figure out which is which, you're probably mistaken. And you should treat it as a risky endeavor and instead think of other things you can do with your time. Now,
voting is that it's just a purely subjective valuation. How much better is one candidate than the other? And they often write, well, all that matters is what you believe the value is. If you believe, like, you know, Ellen Gelman and Captain say, if you believe that candidate A will benefit the population by $1,000 per person compared to candidate B, then you should vote for candidate A. McGaskill says, if your preferred party is Republicans, you might expect to benefit because you'll pay fewer taxes. If your preferred party is the Democrats, you might expect to benefit because you'll receive more government funded um, services. Suppose for the sake of argument, you conclude your preferred party getting your power is worth $1,000 to you. Although this $1,000 per citizen's figure is hypothetical, it seems plausible. It's kind of weird that they say that because that's not how they think about other things. Like they wouldn't go, hey, if you believe that the Red Cross will do $1,000 worth of good with $100 you've given them, you should donate money to them. Instead they go, no, 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 no. You can't just assign a value to what the Red Cross does. Instead it'd be something like, look, you know, even if we're gonna be subjectivist about this, we have to be sort of smart subjectivists. It's like, given your, who knows what you're yeah, given that, it might not, but like given your, uh, here we go, given your values plus the facts about what they're actually going to do, that's going to lead to the expected utility of their outputs, right? So maybe you're, even if we treat your fundamental values about how you value human life as just a subjective valuation, in order to assess the value of what the Red Cross does, we need to know some facts about how they're going to perform. It could be given your subjective values and the facts about their objective performance, giving them money makes things worse. It could be making them better. So they can't be subjectivist all the way. It can't just be as simple as like, no, no, I'm an effective altruist because whenever I give money to like, say, when I give $100 to the English department, I just decide that the thing that they do with it is worth a trillion dollars. It's amazing how much good I do. They, they totally reject that way of thinking. It has to instead be something like, given whatever values you have, there's some fact of the matter about how good a candidate is going to be, or some fact of the matter about how good a charity is going to be. But they, for some reason, drop this when it comes to voting. You know, where did all the standards go? Right? So this is like my view of Mabel McGaskill. Donating $50 to a charity requires high evidentiary standards, but it's okay to use, say, guesstimation when it comes to candidates. That's what he says. But he can't say that, can he? And here's one reason, maybe to make this part a little bit more sophisticated or a little bit more filled out, think of it this way. Imagine candidates could have all of the following sets of preferences, and these preferences may not really be consistent. It may not really line up. You can have what you might call candidate or party preferences. I prefer this candidate to that candidate. Right? That's my ranking. I think this candidate is better than that one. You could have policy preferences, a ranking of the various policy platforms that you think are better or worse. Oftentimes, if you're a sophisticated voter, the reason you prefer this candidate to that candidate is because you think it's more likely this candidate will deliver my preferred policies than that candidate. That's why I'm voting for you, because of the policy package that you endorse. And the reason I might prefer some policies to others is because I have what you might call outcome preferences, the way that I want the world to be. I want crime to go down and unemployment to go down and inflation to go down and prosperity to go up and a certain distribution of income and certain other effects. So the reason I advocate these policies is because I hope these policies will deliver these outcomes. So in a perfectly rational, perfectly consistent voter who is fully informed, what you might expect is that, generally speaking, their outcome preferences will then in turn determine their policy preferences, which will in turn determine their candidate preferences or their party preferences. However, we know that most voters are not that consistent about these things, and partly because they're very badly informed. And McGaskill and others would say this is true of, say, a lot of charities. Like, a lot of what they're saying is, like, you are donating money to, say, Scared Straight. Have you guys heard of Scared Straight? All right. For those of you who haven't, Scared Straight is a program where um, what they basically do is take kids that are, like, between, like, 12 and 15 who are getting started, well, mostly boys who are starting to get into trouble, who look like they might join gangs or get into crime, and they bring them to prison, and then the prisoners there yell at the kids and talk about how much they're going to rape them and beat them. That's what they do. It's a lot of like rape threats. Like when you come to prison, I will rape you. Right? The thought was, if you uh, if you if these boys hear this, they're going to be like, oh, I better not go to prison. Like I better make sure I get to be, behave better and not commit crime. I don't want to go to prison. That guy's going to beat me up and hurt me. So therefore, we'll have lower crime. In fact, there's lots of studies on this, and it turns out that it actually increases crime rather than decreases it. If you take like random assortment and you like, control for all the confounding variables, the kids who kind of by lottery get assigned to steer it straight are much more likely to commit crime and go to jail than the kids who are otherwise demographically and otherwise identical who don't go to steer it straight. The effect's so bad that for every dollar you give to steer it straight, you can expect to cost $200 worth of social harm. 
right? So McCaskill said, you can't just guesstimate what their value is, you have to actually look into it, and that's the facts. Given your own like reasonable assessment of like how to think about crime and the harms of crime, every dollar you give to stare at straight causes $200 in social loss, right? So sometimes we're bad at assessing charities. You could be bad at assessing candidates. Yes? The parallel doesn't seem quite perfect in the sense that it seems like the voting has got a whole other level of worse because like at least with the you're just making a single mistake on the charity side, but it seems like on the voting stuff they're just guessing all the agreeing to disagree like information structure stuff. Is that a fair assessment? It seems like it's even worse in voting because you you're asserting that you're you know, you're kind of re rejecting maybe and updating on what other people are doing. Oh yeah. Too. Is that, I, I think that's totally fair. Uh, it's like the problem of voting has to be much harder than the problem of donating a dollar or fifty dollars to a charity. However much work it takes to assess what counts as a good charity, it should be vastly more difficult to figure out what counts as the better candidate. Right? That seems like the reason, given their own ways of thinking about the epistemic burden of action, that's what they should say. But oddly, they treat voting as if it's really easy and donating to charities is really hard. But you're absolutely right. Men yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, yeah. I mean, I, and on that point, too, it's like, you know, I, I, a, good, a good way to think about the orange man is like, I didn't vote for the orange man. I don't really like the orange man. I'm not here to defend the orange man. But it turns out I was not as pessimistic about American democracy as many other people were. It's quite writing a book called Against Democracy. And the way I know this is because of what happened after, uh, after his initial election. So the day after he was elected, a bunch of my academic friends and colleagues get on Facebook and they say, this is horrible. World War III is going to happen. And here's an actual example. Dan Silverman at the University of Connecticut in the philosophy department there made a bunch of predictions about the horrible things the, Sil the orange man was going to do. And I said, Dan, can you tell me what is your minimal set of conditions for what would constitute this prediction? I forget, I forget what frame was Roe v. Wade or... Uh, or World War III, but he made some sort of mass horrible prediction. I'm like, what were like the minimal conditions that you would consider World War III? And when do you think this will happen? And he said, he told me, and I'm like, I'm like okay, great. I will bet you $5,000 right now that that won't happen. And he wouldn't take me up on it. I, I made similar bets with a bunch of my other colleagues. Like, you're making a prediction about the horrible things the orange man will do. Take my money. Right? Some of them said, no, I don't want to bet you because I'm not selfish. I don't want to just take your money for myself. I'm like, no, of course you're not. Take my money and give it to a good charity. Take my money and give it to like the Democrats to fight the orange man. Just, you know, if you if you think this horrible thing is going to happen, I think it's not. Let me bet you. And they wouldn't take the bet. No one would bet me on any of these things. So, alas. So, I don't know if they really believe it. Yes? So, the is, if you're thinking about voting for this right? Like, they're assuming that voting per se is a public good, and that's like the extent of the complexity of the argument. Yeah, I mean, they just want to say something like, uh, you know, going back to that equation, right? Like the expected, the expected utility of a single vote equals, like, the value of the difference between two candidates, like the value of the Republican candidate minus the value of the Democratic candidate minus their opportunity cost. They want to just say, given your values, whatever your values might be, and then given how these people are likely to perform, there's some sort of number that can be attached to that. And what, what you put in that equation, your sort of value equation could be whatever. It could be however much, you know, if you care about racism, however much money you pay to like, like however much monetary value reducing racism by a certain amount has. If you care about alleviating poverty, whatever dollar amount attaches to that. If you care about, you know, protecting the environment, however much attaches to that. If you care about, which is what I think a lot of academics really care about, the negative meaning of tweets, Right. Okay, throw that in there too. So we're going to be relatively agnostic about what goes into that equation, but just throw it all in there and then discount it by the probability or what will be decisive. So public goods plus justice plus all that other stuff. Put a dollar amount on it. Is that the answer? Or do you have more? Yeah, no, it just it seems like they're looking at voting as a public good, but they're not looking at not voting as a potentially public good, depending on how it informs the particular voter. Yeah, good. That's right. They don't. They don't consider. That's right. They don't really consider the, harm. the potential value of abstention, yeah. right? Maybe abstention has some sort of signaling value, and they don't like put that in their calculation. Like the fact that maybe if like half the country stays home, that has some sort of beneficial effect. They just treat it like. And this is actually going to be. I'll get into some sim something similar in a little bit. That's kind of a problem with this equation in general. Mm -hmm. All it really looks at is we have this particular election, and you can choose this or that. 
what's the value of choosing this over that? It forgets the systematic effects of people presenting themselves to vote in the first place or not presenting themselves to vote at all. And so in a way, even this equation, even if it were right for what it's talk, talking about, there's more to voting than just this. You're, you're absolutely right about that. All right. So we, one of the things we kind of caution people is like, how should you have some degree of epistemic humility about politics? Like all my co my colleagues who made all these predictions, they were wrong about all of them, right? Even even the stuff that's happening with abortion, they're like Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned, and I asked them what it would take for Roe v. Wade to be overturned in their eyes, and they didn't say the Texas bill, right? They're, it's not they had something bigger in mind than that. So I'm going to ask you, like, are you good at predicting what presidents will do? Have you won a lot of money on such predictions? Are you making a lot of money on it? Further, if you might know uh, Philip Teplock's work on expert prediction, you know, Teplock in his famous work on this finds experts are pretty good at predicting what the experts themselves consider the low hanging fruit and what the experts consider hard, they're bad at. Guessing, what about guessing the effects of a single policy? Guessing the effects of a single policy on welfare or other outcomes you might care about is difficult. But then when you're thinking about how to evaluate a candidate, you have to think about all the various policies they might implement, they might fail to implement, and what all the various effects of that might be. It's really, really complicated. And sometimes we have a problem where, like, we have confounding policies. How do we know how to evaluate it when they're doing one thing that's good and one thing that's bad? Oddly, in this very literature, we don't have any of these people who are saying it's easy to vote well and voting is like donating thousands of dollars to charity answering those questions for us. Instead, what we get are mostly post hoc assessments of various uh, of various presidents. So, for instance, Zach Barnett in a paper in Philosophy of Public Affairs, which is largely responding to me. Uh, he was one of my students when I was at Brown. Uh, he was one of my students. I'm, I'm proud of him. Uh, it's cool that he's critiquing me. Like I'm not I'm not hurt by it. I'm glad he's out there. But nevertheless, when he talks about say Bush the second, he's like, look, Bush the second was awful. He started two wars. So obviously, you should have voted for Gore. Yeah, maybe we know that now, but did anyone know that he was going to start these two wars in the year 2000? Zach didn't. What would Gore have done if he'd been president instead? Would Gore have done much differently? We don't really know. I went back and actually looked at like all the various papers in foreign policy magazines and academic journals at trying to estimate what Bush was going to do for his foreign policy, and they didn't predict that he was going to invade Afghanistan or Iraq. 9-11 changed everything. Instead, they thought if he got into any conflicts, it was likely to be with China and Russia. And those same experts predicted that Gore would behave pretty much the same. Bush II was seen as actually fairly pacifist compared to other presidents up and before 9-11. Further, as uh, Whitlin himself says, Bush also did some real good, right? Uh, so he said, this is, this is a quote from him. He says, Bush's famous choice to pursue the Iraq war and so on had thousands of civilian lives and trillions of dollars of spending, but he also dramatically raised U.S. spending on antiviral drugs for impoverished victims of HIV in Africa. The PEPFAR program probably would not have been pursued as absence and likely prevented several million deaths and continues to do so year after year. How do we assess them? Even a post hoc assessment of it is really hard. We don't have, like when you, when you think about how effective altruists talk about charity, they try to come up with things like give well. How many of you guys have heard of give well? people. So GiveWell is an evidence-based, um, is a charity itself, and it does evidence-based assessments of different charities to try to estimate how much bang for your buck do you get if you give money to this particular charity. And every year they'll come up with recommendations of these are the biggest bang for your buck charities. They look at things like looking for real objective evidence of impact, trying to figure out like a, a reasonable shadow pricing model to figure out how to evaluate the, like in feeding a person, what's that worth? Deworming a kid, what is that worth? They, they think about things like where things are under diminishing marginal returns curves, and they put all this in and they'll come up with a ranking of different charities to whom you should consider giving to. Like, so it's often like against Malaria Foundation, Deworm the World Initiative, a few things like that are often really high bang for their buck. And you can look and see all their data. It's quite good. There's nothing like this for voting, is there? We barely have post hoc assessments of candidates. It's very hard to find a reliable pre hoc assessment. We don't have good counterfactual assessments. But it gets worse. One reason it gets worse is because it's often not clear whether this number here is all that high. So for instance, a couple months ago, there was a really good paper published in American Political Science Review by these two, where they look at, uh, I'm gonna, you can see it, like uh, we looked at economic, education, crime, family, social, environmental, and health outcomes after elections at the state level. When the Republicans or the Democrats control a particular state, we measured as best we can eight sets of outcomes 
all over about a bunch of different things and tried to figure out what impact having Republicans or Democrats has on those outcomes. And their answer is, this is APSR, for those who are political scientists, that's like the best journal in political science, right? You definitely want to, you definitely want to publish in this journal if you can. Uh, they said, nah, it looks like their relationship is basically zero. There's, there's no measurable outcome on the short term. And, you know, I think maybe in the long term it's bigger, but it's really hard to know in part because like in the long term, you get the confounding factor of like replacing governments with new governments, you start confounding the data. So this is like, I, I looked hard, I'm like, what are there good papers like this? And the very few that are like this are pretty much like, as far as we using our best available methods can find, we can't actually tell what this is. After the fact, it looks like it's kind of like zero. Right? We're kind of prejudiced to believe it's really a big deal if like, you know, my party wins and the other party loses. It's such going to be a big, big thing. But maybe it's not the big a deal. I mean, when the Patriots lose, I feel really bad. And when they win, I feel really great. And I still have Tom Brady, so when he wins, I feel great about it too. But maybe it just doesn't really matter all that much. Oddly, though, the reaction to this is not to say, well, we, you know, you're right, Brennan. We need to have the same standards we have we should have at least the same epistemic standards we have for voting as we do for charity. We should treat them at least the same, even though, as you're pointing out, they're actually one's a lot harder, right? But they basically just say, just use your confidence, you know? Hey, man, if you're, like, if you're 70% confident one's better, you should vote that way. That can't be right. But it gets worse. One reason it gets worse is because of the problem of normative uncertainty, right? So maybe your values are themselves mistaken. You don't have to necessarily be a, a, a subjective about this. For instance, and I'm not here to advocate this view, but just as a consideration, what if, how many of you think it's okay to eat meat? Right, most of you think it's okay to eat meat. What if it turns out that there's like a, imagine there's like a one in 10 chance it turns out that animal lives matter. And that animal lives matter, say, a 10th as much as human lives, right? Well, if that's the case, then, you know, thinking of the value, like all the animals that are tortured and killed every year for us to eat them in our salads, right? Uh, <laughs> If, if that has like a one in 10 chance of being the same, having a 10th of the value of a human life, then the amount of harm that we're causing is astronomically high by eating meat, right? What if it turns out that there's say a one in 10 chance that pro-life is right? The pro-life position is right. There's a one in 10 chance of that. Well then how should we figure that into? Well, what they, what effective altruists would say about this, the way that they think about normative uncertainty in other cases is well, 50 million abortions per year discounted by the uncertainty that we specified equals five million lives per loss per year, which putting a reasonable dollar value on the human life equals $35 trillion in lost lives per year. Now, given their own way of thinking, that's how they should assess this. This is how they think about risk, including the risk that we're wrong about our values. Oddly, they, again, don't apply it to voting. What about how smart voters are? Well, frankly, I won't belabor this, but the empirical evidence is that most voters, this is like for experts, right? How hard it is for experts like me. We're good at this stuff and do this for a living to figure out which candidate is better. You know, if like God appeared before me or an evil demon appeared before me and was like, you have to assess, you know, in the 2024 election, how much better this candidate is over this candidate. You have to get it right within $200 billion. And if you don't, I'm killing your kids instantly. I give them a big hug because they're going to die. Right. And I'm good at this stuff. I'm good at this compared to the average voter. Right? I publish on this stuff. I'm pretty good at it. And I suck at it. What about the average voter? Well, what do we know about them? Uh, for the most part, they join political parties for non-cognitive, non-ideological reasons. They vote to fit in with their peer group. Um, they're, for the most part, not really voting on the basis of policy. It's more common for them to advocate a policy because their party advocates it than for them to advocate a party because they like their policies. It's more, for most Democrats, it's your, your vote Democrat. You don't vote Democrat because you're pro-gun control. You're pro-gun control because you're Democrat. And the reason you're Democrat is because you have a certain demographic group that is for historically arbitrary reasons attached to the Democrats. People rationalize and are horrible at assessing evidence. And they pretty much try to just believe whatever they want to believe is true rather than what the evidence says, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we know about voters. The evidence for that's pretty strong. Do we really want to just tell them to guesstimate? Well, McGaskill might say, okay, my book, taken literally, tells everyone to vote, and that can't be right. However, let's be clear. Who's actually reading my book? <laughs> really smart people, right? I mean, he's sold a lot of copies. So, like, you know, Students in Jay's class, because you like to assign that book, Jay, but your students are all Georgetown students. Look how smart they are. Really smart people. Are they immune to this? Maybe they're better. So maybe if I say to smart people, you should vote, then that's fine. I did say it as a way of like 
smart, everyone should vote, and I really just mean the people in this room, I don't mean the people out there, but I said it as if a way as if I intended to include them. Okay, so maybe I should kind of hedge my bets a bit and say, no, really only the smart people should vote. Well, you know, the problem is the evidence says that even the smart people engage in the same kind of propensity to rationalize. You know, so for example, there's a famous study by Kahan or famous studies by Milton, uh, by Lodge and Tabor that basically say the higher IQ you are, the better you are at rationalizing that the evidence says whatever you want it to say, right? So Kahan has a, a famous study where he assesses people's ability to do math and he gives them like a fake study. He says, here's some fake study with made up data. Just to be clear, I completely made this up. All I'm asking you is, what is the, if the data were correct, what would it suggest? And he gives them a fake study about the effectiveness of different toothpastes. And some people can't do the math, so they just get it wrong. But some people are smart and they can do the math and they say, okay, this data implies that toothpaste works or it doesn't work. You know, the people who are good at stats. He gives them exactly the same study with the same numbers, but he changes it to be, uh, this is again, a made up study, it's fake. Just to be clear, it is not a real study. All I'm asking is if the study were, the data were correct, what would it say about the effectiveness of gun control? And the, Ben, the people who, uh, who can't do the math are like, I don't know. But then the people who can't do the math if they're, if they're good at math, they go and they like gun control. They say that the data supports gun control. If they don't like gun control, they say the data is against gun control. But he's controlled it. It's not true. They just read the numbers as saying what they think. The better they are at math, the more they rationalize that the made-up data implies what they think. Even though they're told it's fake, right? I mean, that's weird. So McGaskill says, all right, well, you know, maybe we should just guesstimate. But again, we have all these biases that make us bad at guesstimating. I won't go through them all. We have tons and tons of biases. So I'm worried. I'm also worried because, you know, so, so basically what we're doing here is we're granting them that this number is a lot higher than we used to think it was. That the number here, the probability of being decisive is much higher than I was taught when I was in college, right? But so far I've been asking, like, what is actually this number? How effective are people at figuring out this number? How good are you at figuring out whether you should vote Democrat or Republican, what's the actual evidence for this? What are all the biases and problems we have that make it likely that this is a risky assessment for us and we're not in a good position to know? What about this number? What about the opportunity cost? They say things like, all right, we grant that maybe you should know something. You can't literally just show up and be like, Trump Clinton. Trump's kind of a goofy sounding name. Clinton sounds more dignified. Boop. They, know, they, they may have to know more than that, they go, well, how long does it really take for you to become informed? It's like voting takes an hour. That's a pretty that's pretty low use of your time. What else are you gonna do in an hour? You know, if you if you worked for an hour and earned a salary and donated that money to say um, deworm the world initiative, you know, you guys get paid pretty well here. So you might get a, you maybe get paid like 150 bucks an hour or something like that. You're in business school, right? So you get a good salary, give it to deworm the world initiative. That's like worth like six hundred dollars in social benefits. But hey, that's not the same thing as voting for a congressional candidate or something, that's like worth like $50,000. But what does it actually take to vote well? Well, you need to know basic political facts, which most people don't know. You need to learn some social science so you can assess those facts. It's not enough to know this candidate supports free trade and this candidate supports protectionism. I need to know which of these policies is likely to deliver the goods. I also need to know what's the chance that you'll actually implement what you promised to do. You know, like Trump promised to build a border wall, didn't really. You know, Biden were promised a bunch of stuff. He hasn't done it yet. Like they make promises, doesn't mean we'll actually do it. You need to be able to make some good assessments of the candidates' platforms. And you have to overcome your own biases. I'm gonna guess that that takes more than an hour, right? One reason it takes more than an hour is because like I spent like my whole life on working on this stuff, and I'm not particularly good at it, and I'm better at it than almost everybody else. So like, how can it be that easy? What do voters actually know? <clears throat> Nothing. It gets worse too because. Uh, at best here, you're, for the most part, you're making what they would say is a donation to the developed world. Yeah, maybe US, the US president has a big effect on the world as a whole, so you have effect on world welfare. But effective altruists will often say things like this. Hold on, you're thinking about donating $100 to a charity that feeds homeless people in Austin, or a charity that helps like impoverished kids in Austin get laptops. That's great, but remember that poverty in the US, you know, if this is the distribution of world income, purchasing price parity for, um, revised and so on, or adjusted, a person at the poverty line in the United States is still about here. So when you give that person money, you're lifting them up, but it's kind of like taking a person up here and boosting them up from there in terms of their diminishing returns on value investment. You can give money to kids who are like genuinely poor, in deeply, deeply poor parts of the world. That $100 will do a lot more good for them than it will do to someone who's poor by American standards. 
So you might also expect them to say, well, voting is mostly like making a donation, if it is a donation at all, to the developed world. And they always say you should focus your energy on the undeveloped world because it does, it's easier. Or you, it's easier to do more good. Now, sometimes what happens in response to these kinds of complaints is people say, just use heuristics. Right. So I have a picture here of Tom Cristiano from the University of Arizona. Whenever I say anything about democracy, his response is, and I'll try to imitate his voice, you just have to use heuristics and shortcuts. Right. And when I hear him say that, I feel like he's saying a prayer. Right. Heuristics and shortcuts. Because it, he makes it sound like it's really easy to do that. But in fact, the empirical literature on heuristics and shortcuts is not clearly saying that they work. It doesn't say they say that people just follow thought leaders. Like, you're a Republican, you just find like with a Republican for flapping head on TV says, and you do what they say, the Democrat does the same. These are only reliable if the people that you're listening to are particularly reliable, and people just pick the group they're in group. So it's, it's not really solving the problem. And in fact, you know, the Oxford uh, Research Encyclopedia has a nice summary of the heuristics and bias literature. It's like, yeah, it's not, we don't have any strong evidence that this works. All right. So it gets worse, though, because part of, you might wonder about the political economy of voting in the first place. One problem is, is that when there's a really tight election, like if this ends up being like a swing state, then the parties do more to kind of throw money at things and get turnout. So your vote matters more, but because your vote matters more, it becomes ever more likely that other people will appear on the other side to kind of oppose your vote. We don't have that when it comes to, say, charity. It's not like when you show that Deworm the World Initiative is really effective, then another counter charity called Reworm the World Initiative gets out there and tries really hard to collect donations to undo the work that you do. But that is part of the problem. The more likely your vote makes a difference, the more likely it is that your vote, others will vote against you and so on and so on. There's further a bizarre aggregation problem in the way that they offer this advice. They basically say, all of you voters, let's say you're Republicans or you're Democrats, Republicans, you should regard your votes as being worth a thousand dollars, have an expected utility of a thousand dollars, and you know the cost to you of voting is ten bucks. So you know the overall, it's great, it's worth doing. And you Democrats, you should regard your votes as being worth a thousand dollars. But there's something weird about making that as advice because I can't get up here and go, hey, given my own values, I regard like you, the people in favor of deworm the world initiative, you should regard donations to them as being worth a thousand dollars. And you, the people in favor of giving the kids worms, you should be in favor of you know, thinking that your, your donations worth like a thousand dollars. It can't be both, it's gonna be one or the other. So I can't make this as general advice. I have to say rather like, I, I only want the people voting the right way to vote. Otherwise you guys are just canceling each other out. So everyone vote is sort of like saying, everyone should donate to either reworm or deworm the world. Doesn't matter which one. Make sure when you leave the, the building today, I'm gonna to have a couple boxes that one gives money to deworm the world initiative. The other one gives money to reworm the world initiative. Make sure to put a donation. Doesn't matter which one. No, obviously it matters which one. And if you, if, it, if, they, if one side wins, then good or bad happens. And if you're exactly 50-50, then we just cancel each other. But it gets more complicated in part, and this is the thing you're asking about, like the question you're asking about, because this equation has to be too simple. This equation just looks at the value of a vote, given that there's some candidates on the table, and you could vote for one or the other. But there's other effects that they don't measure. Like one you mentioned, like, what about the value of abstention? The fact that we have seen, does that signal something? Does that affect the quality of government in some way? We have to put that into a calculation. But also, you have to think about the kinds of candidates or the kinds of people that they run in the first place. Parties want to win power. And so the quality of the candidates and the kinds of candidates they run, the platforms that they run and so on, is not some exogenous variable. It's endogenous to voter behavior and voter quality. So one way of thinking about that is if, let's say, Carlos, you're a high quality voter. When you threaten to vote, in a way, like the party, if they're responsive to that, they might think, well, we're getting more and more people like Carlos voting, so we want to empower. The more and more people like you vote, the more we might shift our candidates towards like high quality, sophisticated, policy wonk type people that actually implement policies that might work. Right? The evidence might say they work. And let's say, I don't know, so I'll make you my dumb voter. No offense. Nothing about you in particular. I just move around the room. Let's, right, let's say that you're kind of like a dumb voter. You know, you're, you're like my dad. You just sort of vote on the basis of like your feelings, evidence just bounces right off your forehead, right? When people like you threaten to vote and you're gonna vote for symbolic or large expressive things from the basis of nonsense, they're like, we wanna win. So if more and more people like you vote, the less they try to run candidates that appeal to you and the more they run candidates that appeal to you. So if they're thinking about the marginal value of a vote, 
then you might think that if we have you know, two kinds of candidates, we call them smart and dumb, right? Then we have to think about how does adding voters on the smart side or the dumb side nudge the distribution? And you think of like kind of basic median voter model or something like that, then adding more smart voters should increase the quality of candidates, probably a very tiny amount. And then adding dumb voters should increase the quality of candidates, probably a tiny amount. But given Gellman and Kaplan's and others their own way of calculating these things, probably the threat of you voting is roughly on par with the value of your voting in the first place in terms of the effect of candidate quality. So to really continue to add this up, we need to know something like this. What's the probability that they will run a smart candidate given that you are likely to vote smart minus the probability they run the smart candidate given that you don't vote at all? And then what's the probability they run a dumb or awful candidate given the probability that you're threatening to vote for the awful candidate minus like the probability they won't vote, uh, run him given that you don't vote at all? We need to know that stuff too. That has to figure into the equation. I don't know what the number is. Maybe it's vanishingly small. There's not like a literature on this. It's mostly overlooked. But given what Gellman, Kaplan, and others say, you might expect them to think it's probably pretty high, um, as high as something like that. It gets worse, though. I mean, I have a litany of complaints. It gets worse because, uh, because in part because there's a phenomenon in psychology called moral licensing. And this is something that effective altruists are concerned about elsewhere. Moral licensing works like this. Uh, for instance, do you know who tends to be very aggressive as drivers? Who, given particular car brands, like BMW drivers are aggressive when they drive, right? That's, that's true. It turns out, like you might have that as a stereotype. That actually turns out to be true. I don't have my keys on me. I have a BMW and I'm a pretty aggressive driver. And I'm from Boston too, so it's like, right? I love living in DC because I think everyone there's a wuss when it comes to driving. The outsiders think that it's such an aggressive city. No, these people are so soft, it's great. So BMW drivers are, are a-holes, but also Prius drivers turn out to be a-holes, right? Prius drivers turn out to be a-holes, and part of what goes on there is you're like, I invested in getting this car that makes me a good person, and as a result, I'm entitled to cut people off. And they do. There are papers published about how they cut people off more than others. The thing that explains this is something called moral accounting, which is somewhat controversial. There's some questions about how much this stuff replicates. But moral accounting basically says, when you do something nice, you give yourself permission to do something bad to make up for it. And when you do something bad, you have to do something nice to make up for it. People are sort of at, aiming for like a B average in their overall ethics. And so if they do something that puts them up to a B plus, they're like, good enough, I can act like a jerk for a while, right? So, well, if we tell people, hey, when you voted today, Carlos, as a New Mexican uh, voter, that was like donating $50,000 to charity. Oh, on top of it, I'd like to collect $10,000 for you for the Save the Children's Fund. What do you think? You're like, dude, I just donated $50,000 to charity. Maybe I'll give a little bit less. Maybe I don't have to, I, I did my part. What am I supposed to do as a good person? This much, this much goodness per year? Well, I voted, I already did it. So I think I'll spend that money on a uh, new Xbox or something instead. I don't know how much that will happen, but it should happen on the margins. So to sort of summarize this all, I really don't think they're, I think effective altruists advocate voting because they're not being good effective altruists. <laughs> Outside of politics, effective altruists generally say that we should recognize our bad epistemic states, recognize our biases, recognize our ignorance, and direct our efforts towards cases where we are justified, not really believe, but justified in believing that we have a greater expected chance of doing good. But they don't say that inside of politics. Inside of politics, they say, guesstimate and go for the thing you think is better. It's easy. We should see ourselves as being in the dilemma of the biased, partly colorblind, highly unreliable, highly overconfident, and difficult to rehabilitate button pushers who have to choose between burgundy and maroon. If that were the actual dilemma, effective altruists would say, don't touch the buttons, go do something else. But I think that's the dilemma we are in for voting. At least all the rest of them. Us in this room, I'm sure we're fine. <laughs> So that's that's the idea. Um, I guess we can break some, obviously, right? But no, I'm happy to take your uh, your comments, questions, concerns, and so on. Thank you. Question online. None online yet. Some people complaining, no? No, just uh, not complaining. Okay. <laughs> just technical, no, no, technical, no, technical right, questions. <laughs> uh, yes. So you're a philosopher, and I'm not, right? So you're just evaluating. I'm wondering if you look at the positive results from voting behavior to see if it adds any weight to this argument as well. So it seems to me that abstention rates are very high, yeah. uh, which suggests that if you're, if you're cult, if non discernible color buttons may be more important than people thinking in the real world. 
I guess this actually is with your philosophy. Just how much do we philosophers internalize the evidence and formulate one of them stuff? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I have some of this in the paper, but not in the presentation itself. Because one of the questions I wonder is, is this just they know it's not true, but it's useful propaganda? Right. So suppose, so imagine the following is true. I, Jay Brennan, I happen to know which candidate is better, right? Because I just have direct access to that truth. Just, just imagine that. I'm, I'm, I also happen to know that if I can convince you in the room that you should vote, that the effect of that will be positive. I go and I get you to vote, and you're more likely to vote for the good candidate than the bad candidate. So I don't even try to convince you to vote for the right candidate. I just say voting is really important, and I convince all of you to vote. And then as a result, my propaganda of convincing you to vote, my, I like tell you your vote matters a lot, even though it doesn't. I lie to you about that. But convincing you that it's true gets a bunch of you to vote. And then collectively, this produces good outcomes. In that kind of case, I might think, oh, an effective altruist thing for me to do would be to convince you that voting is effective altruism even though it isn't, because on a case-by-case -case basis, it's not. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis, in fact, you are a high-risk person. And if you were applying the standards consistently, you'd be like, I should be cautious. My convincing you to throw caution to the wind actually ends up being beneficial, because I know this about the audience, and I can predict the benefits, right? Um, you know, it, it's the kind of thing, like, it could be like, just imagine that there's two charities, A and B, and people know nothing, but I just happen to know people are biased to pick A over B, and I know A is better. So if I tell you all to just donate as much money as possible, I know A will get a lot of money, and that's good. If that's what they're doing, you know, there's something to be said for that. I, I still wonder, but there's something to be said for, like, for that kind of propaganda. So but, like, lots of uncomfortable lying to people that they will cause them to do the right thing? Well, I mean, I wonder, because if you're an effective altruist, then you might think, yeah, lying about the effectiveness of effective altruism might be useful for getting effective to getting good results. So you could imagine a, a pure consequentialist saying, "I know what I'm saying isn't true, but it's useful." I, I actually have heard a person do this before. I won't I won't say her name, but there was a, a grad student I went to uh, a college or went, went to grad school with, and she was actually like like talking about the contents of her dissertation, um, and one of my fellow grad students said to her, "You don't actually believe this, do you?" And she's like, "Oh no, no, I know what I'm saying is false, but it'd be useful if I can convince other people it's true to make the world a better place." So I know there are people who think that way. Uh, so effectively, what I'm doing here is saying, "Look, McGaskill and Weblin and others who write about this, given what you're, if, if I take you as trying to articulate the truth about voting, what I think you should say is it does turn out." that the probability of voting decisive is higher, but what that means is that we now have to treat voting as a high-risk activity. We have to apply your standards consistently. When we apply them consistently, rather than recommending people vote, what we should do is recommend caution. We should be like, oh no, hold on, voting can matter a lot. Uh, but it could be that they, they actually know what they're saying isn't literally true, and it's just useful to convince people that's true because it will produce good effects. Given our audience, given how smart our audience is, given the bias our audience has, it probably will push them you know, lead to a good public effect of pushing them in the direction of, of good votes rather than bad. So if that's what they're doing, I mean, that, I'm still right because what they said was literally wrong, but uh, maybe that's their justification. What about the second question? Uh, does evidence weigh on how philosophers think about this? Because I would imagine the rates of voting are higher than the rates of going to right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's a puzzle. These guys are trying to be evidence-based philosophers, where really the empirics really matter to them. And so for them, the question really has to be, should I be trying to nudge? If you're going to spend your, what are you going to do on Tuesday afternoon? Is voting like a good use of your time? Is it likely to help people out? Is there something better you can do with your time? If you set out to like make the world a better place, is showing up in the voting booth the best thing? What would I recommend as an effective altruist? And they have all these other standards when it comes to thinking about how you volunteer, how you donate. It just seems to me like they're not using those standards here. So I think I think they are trying to be sensitive to that very question. I just think they're not doing it properly, right? And there are other kinds of arguments philosophers and others give on behalf of voting that have nothing to do with the effects of voting and, and like are are not about the outcomes. They're just about the symbolic value and so on. They're not talking about that stuff. For them, they're treating voting as as an alternative to making a donation, as an alternative to watching TV. You're just looking at the expected consequences of it. Yes? Uh, as a business school professor that studies this stuff, what do you, what do you make out of this recent kind of firms giving people a day off, time off to, uh, to go vote? Yeah, uh, I mean, given what I just said, I think it's probably, 
it's, it's probably a bad idea. Um, I think there's other things people can do that are more productive and better use of their time. So it's not that I'm saying no one should ever vote, everyone should abstain or something like that. I'm sure there's an awful model of voting, but uh, frankly, I think most of us do a lot more good, know we're doing a lot more good by a lot of our other kinds of activities than we are by voting. I think the average person working the average firm makes bigger contributions to humanity by working with that firm that day than they are going to do by voting. Right. And that, taking into account all the risk and everything else. So if you're like you're like you're an auto you're a uh, motorcycle mechanic, and you can spend today fixing motorcycles, or you can spend today voting and then going home and watching TV. If your goal is to help people, I think fixing motorcycles is probably the way to go for you. You have to be a pretty exceptional person to be in a situation where like you voting really is the thing that made a big difference and made the world a lot better. Right. I, and I think. Honestly, we should, that's the thing, I've often considered kind of an elitist about uh, voter behavior, because look at how ignorant everybody is and how badly informed and how badly they reason. But I'm also a big populist when it comes to thinking about civic virtue. Because my view is like, you know, my colleagues, what they think it is to be a civically virtuous citizen is to be someone like me who votes a lot more than me, and gives more money to charity than But like, you should be a person who knows a ton about politics, talks about politics all day, and does as much political stuff as possible. And I'm like, you know, civic virtue is the disposition to make a positive contribution to the common good of your polity. You can do that all sorts of ways other than through politics. In fact, for most of us, politics is a pretty bad way of doing it. Most of us are better positioned to make that contribution through other means. We should recognize that and celebrate it. So I would say like, yeah, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos taking the day off from running Amazon to vote. That's not a good contribution. You're much better off like uh, Amazon. And similarly, like, you know, even like, He's a high-level person, but you know, a surgeon taking the day off from like curing cancer to go vote? No, cure cancer. But the motorcycle, motorcycle mechanic too. Fix motorcycles. You're definitely doing a lot of good. And then if you want to help people, donate some of that money to Deworm the World Initiative, right? Should you go vote? It's not clear that it's not really clear. But even on the best available evidence in APSR, whether the candidates really matter. Um, but even if they did matter, the chances that you know which one it is are so low. Do something else. So, what's is there any evidence that these efforts to, you know, again, motivated by this, there's a lot of efforts to get out and vote. And you know, we're surrounded here in an environment where it's like nauseating. Like, get out and vote, get back here. You know, I'm like, yeah. But when I go to my gun store, I like to make more vote. <laughs> um, is there any evidence that tells us that, you know, in the, the, the different political persuasions are more into this whole push for get out of vote. And if so, what does that tell us about the argument? Is that something that is just like strategic? Because, you know, is the kind of people that you want to support for your game that will maybe react to that uh, versus yeah. like, like, no, this is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, again, like this is some of your question. Like I'm, for the sake of argument in this paper, I'm taking this argument not as being, what we're saying isn't literally true. It's just strategic for us to say it. I'm just evaluating. No, but, but it's that evidence of that. Yeah. So left and right be uh, different there. But, but there is evidence on this. Um, so what you know, you might wonder, uh, like for instance, why are firms so left wing all of a sudden? Like they've gone very left wing in terms of their corporate governance, despite the U.S. still being pretty, pretty, you know, having a pretty decent bell curve like that in terms of its left versus right wing um, uh, persuasion. And one of the things that other political scientists find when they work on this is that the left tends to have stronger preferences than the right. Right, so just start, so what I mean by that is like, imagine my favorite pizza topping is pepperoni and your favorite pizza topping is anchovies. But you really, really, really love anchovies. Failing to have anchovies on your pizza really bums you out. Whereas, you know, I just, I prefer pepperoni to not having pepperoni, but I don't really care that much. So when you look at American voters now, what you tend to find is that right-wing voters prefer some policies to others, but their rank, their strength of preference is fairly weak. Left-wing voters prefer some policies to others, and their strength of preference is very, very strong. Their preference also for political expression is much stronger. Their preference that you engage in similar political expression is much stronger. They want their preference even for like, uh, like you might know about political polarization and the um, sort of segregation that happens as a result, right? So um, like people in the 1960s used to find lots of mixed zip codes where people with different political persuasions live next to each other. There's been a great sort where people avoid living near the others to different opinions. The left is much more intolerant than the right when it comes to this. They're much more inclined to, I only want to live and work for people that I agree with. The right is relatively weak in their preferences. I'm not saying this is because of like, well, the right's better. You know, I'm sure that it holds too, right? Um, but, but nevertheless, the left has strong preferences. So I, would, I guess it would make sense then that 
given that kind of strength of political preference, you'd be, you'd be more likely to see left-wing people going, you better go damn vote if you don't, you're a bad person, than right-wing people at the gun store, which is mostly gonna be right-wing people going, they're, they're just not that into it. They don't care about politics as much. They don't have a strong strength of preference, so they let it slide. Yeah. So how should we think about voting? I mean, voting is a really high-risk activity. Uh, if you're a typical citizen, it's really difficult for you to figure out which candidate is better. If you think that it's easy for you to figure out which candidate is better, it's almost certainly because it's hard and you're super biased, right? Uh, you'd have to you'd have to genuinely be exceptional to be different. So, like. And also, even on the Edlin Gelman Kaplan model, which is the most optimistic model of the literature, most voters in most states, their votes have low expected utility or disutility. Like your Texas, are you living in Texas? Yes. Are you in Texas? You vote in Texas? Even their model basically says, yeah, your vote is in order. So it, what should you do with your time on that Tuesday? You know, hug your kids, garden, watch TV, go work in a soup kitchen, pick up litter. Uh, you know, earn a lit, like earn it, work an extra hour, you can't do it all. Salary, but work an hour overtime and donate that money, that extra overtime money to Deworm the World Initiative. Those are all things that will make a better positive contribution than voting. And that's on that's on their model, ignoring everything I just said, because you're Texan, right? For me in Virginia, which is closer to being a swing state, according to their theory, if this number is pretty high, like a trillion dollars, then my vote has an expected utility of like plus or minus ten thousand dollars. But the problem is. I'm probably an idiot. I don't know which one it is. So if there's a button that's like, all right, when you press this button, you're either going to cost the world ten thousand dollars or gain ten thousand dollars. What should you do? Something else. Don't push it. That's my view. Do something else. I have one more question. Sure. Uh, this week, next week, Tuesday, next week, there's a there's an election in Austin, very specific to the city here, and basically the ballot proposition that says refund the police versus defund the police. That's essentially the, the city has been funded effectively already. This is like say, hey, no, we need to force a certain number of cops per city. That's basically what it is. Yeah. Um, incredibly low turnout. There's no other thing going on in Texas in terms of the election next Tuesday, right? Right. So this is a situation where where uh, the probability of a vote making is much much higher. Right. And okay, so I don't know what my question is. Is it worth voting in this that you don't want? Is this because yeah, the Delta like there is, is, is critical? I think the Delta there is pretty big. Right. In my life, I mean, everybody like in this room here, like murder rates are you know quadruple in two years. Yeah. So like, well, that may be matter to us directly, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. This shows you a lot about how voters are thinking because what you would expect them to do if they really were vote, if they were voting for the purpose of changing policy, if that were their goal. And one of those books I put up there, uh, a couple of those books, there's a book by Lillian and Mason, um, Uncivil Agreement, and the book by Bartels and Deacon, uh, uh, Democracy for Realists, they say voters are not voting for policy. They don't, they don't even really care. About it. But if they were voting for policy, you'd expect them to have high turnout here, because it's, it's a small scale thing where it's easy to assess the evidence, it's easy to collect the evidence, it directly affects them, and their votes can matter a lot, so why not make a big impact? But it's not sexy, it's not part of that big national drama that's to turn out. Um, that's a case where, Hey, me personally, I would go vote because I wrote a book on criminal justice reform. And I've read all of that literature on you know funding police and so on. And I, as a person who I kind of think in my heart, I'm pretty anti-police. I when I've been asked because of my criminal justice book, what do you think about defund the police? And like, no, at least a higher crime. Uh, we need police reform, but just reducing the number of cops hurts the very people you're trying to help. There's different things you should do. So I think for me, it's easy. I, I've already done the homework. I don't want to. Do it. So the problem though is what about the average voter? Do they have a, that's a relatively easy question. It's relatively constraining. It's one policy in one place. And yeah, you're then, right, but they, they, they vote on the team here. Yeah. If you're a Democrat, you're gonna say no, no Bible problems. That's yeah, that. exactly. And that's the problem. It's like, this is a case where actually there is a robust literature on this, so very good empirical literature. And if they take in a stats class with you, they could know how to read those papers and assess them, but they haven't. So they're not likely to read them. And we know that if we give them the papers, they're likely to think the papers just say what they want. We, or they're likely to just look for papers that reassemble from their view, and they're likely to just go along with whatever other people in their group are doing, right? It's important that I say, Tom Brady's the greatest of all time, because then my friends reward me for that. And it's important that you say, defund the police, because then your friends reward you. And that's what motivates you. So in a way, this is a relatively easy problem, but 
the typical voter is going to be beset by cognitive bias. It's going to make it harder for them to assess what the answer is, even though I think in this case there is a clear answer. There's, a, there's a literature done by people like us that's, that's on this. It's not univocal, but it's pretty close to it that like simply defunding the police just leads to more crime. Police presence is over, overall a good thing. The problems with the police are endemic and, pers and, and whole, horrible things, but it's just illuminating that it's not the solution, right? Yeah. It's maybe a, beyond, beyond what you think about, but what's the alternative? If we, if we don't vote to choosing leaders, choosing policies, you know, that it, it makes more sense. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things about this is like, this is what we thinking on the margin type stuff. The effective altruists are all about thinking on the margin. And so they're basically, their, their advice when they're saying this is like, you should go vote for every additional person who hears me. Not, and again, it's not supposed to be strategic, but people who happen to hear you, but any random person thinking on the margin should go, right? Uh, and so I'm saying, no, thinking on the margins of the individual person, like who had a proper assessment of the evidence and the risks would go, yeah, what is going to give you my time? I should do something else. Now, what does that mean about choosing government policy in general? You know. Uh, I think having widespread elections in the form that we do incentivize bad behavior, I would recommend we do radically different things. So my friend Alex Guerrero at the um, University of Rutgers, uh, he, he recommends we have lottery-based systems. We randomly select, say, 500 citizens, and they and only they get to vote, and they have a strong incentive to get it right. Um, I recommend using having elections but doing a kind of statistical manipulation where Everyone votes, but they vote. I'm not going to all the details. They vote for what they know, who they, it tells who they are, what they know, and what they want. And then we statistically estimate what the public would have wanted. It was demographically identical and got a perfect score on a knowledge quiz that we did that. That's what I would recommend doing instead of the lotteries. But I, so I don't think we should dispense with elections. I'm not saying I want to wave my magic wand and have no one vote at all. I mean, I would kind of get a kick out of that, frankly. But I, <laughs> never, if literally no one showed up for a presidential election, I would, I would think that's super fun. But I don't really recommend that in the long term. Uh, so there are these other alternatives, but just straight voting like this way, I think is not great. But again, they're making this argument about on the margin, what should you do? So I'm also making an argument about on the margin, what should you do? Yes? We have an online question, so I'm gonna ask, Ashley, if you wanna unmute yourself. Um, I, I think you, hi, I'm Ashley. <laughs> I think that you maybe kind of answered my question already, but my question was gonna be, um, what would be the like ultimate outcome of everyone taking this advice though? I mean, how, how do you determine whether, well, if everyone here, for instance, decided that they weren't going to, they weren't informed enough to vote. And I would imagine that the people on this call are probably like at least somewhat more invested in the political system than even the average voter, just because they're on this call right now or at this talk. Um, so if none of us feel like we are informed enough to vote um, and then, from that logic, very, I feel like very few people would be informed to vote. Then, what kind of like political system does that look like? And like, is is that something that you're in favor of? I suppose. Yeah, great question. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, a couple of years like, back in 2011, I published my first book independently. I wrote a book with, a, with my advisor. I won't give you credit for that. But then I wrote a book called The Ethics of Voting. And one of the arguments in The Ethics of Voting was that if you're badly informed, you should choose not to vote. But I also said in the book, this book is self-effacing in the following sense. It gets to the question of strategic versus trying to say what's true, which is what's strategic to say. The people who are reading this book, given my audience, are unusually smart and good as voters. They still have a lot of cognitive bias, but they're still better than average. And so I don't I don't mean to be like the audience of my book in particular should stay home. Like it's better that you're voting than a lot, let's say that my dad votes, right? Like you're better at voters than average. I remember like presenting this argument to Jeff Brennan, who I mentioned before, and he was like, you know, you're right. I guess I actually don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Maybe I shouldn't vote. He wasn't being sarcastic. He was like genuinely worried. And I'm like, Jeff, if there's a good voter in the world, it's you, right? Like of all the people, if I could pick one person to vote, it would probably be you, right? Like you're the guy. So uh, it is true that like in terms of this, despite the stuff I said about cognitive bias and IQ making us better at rationalizing, it is true that people in this room are probably, and you are likely statistically speaking to be significantly better at voting than average um, and better at assessing evidence and all of that. 
So I don't really mean to say like none, I, I, again, I guess I would say like your votes don't really matter very much. You live in Texas, it's not a good use of your time, but I don't want to make an argument where like what effectively happens is my audience of smart people all stay home from voting and then the QAnon conspiracy theorists win the day. So no, um, in terms of systematic behavior, I do think we should de-emphasize voting as a contribution. We shouldn't treat it as the be all end all of what it is to be a good citizen. And I'd like to have lower cost mechanisms for making collective decisions. I think the, the big dilemma that we have with collective decisions is this. If you concentrate power in the hands of a small number of people, they are incentivized to think very carefully about the use of that power, but they're incentivized to use that power for their self-interest at the expense of others. If we spread power out among the many, they are no longer incentivized to use their power selfishly. And that's why we find voters are not very selfish, but they're not incentivized to use their power carefully or to know what they're doing. So our choices seem always to be smart sociopaths or dumb nice people, dumb sociotropes. I want to somehow split the difference and get as best we can smart sociotropes. Um, so I think some of those problems, some of those things I talked about before about having a lottery-based system like Guerrero or Claudio Lopez Guerra defend, or maybe having this what I call government by simulated oracle, or sometimes we call light preference voting. These might be systems to try to extract wisdom from the crowd better and get smarter policies. Whether they really work, we don't really know because they haven't really even tried. Um, so yeah, I I, I don't really don't think having 120 million people vote is a good use of time. I think you know, and actually this is a good point for a lot of your statisticians, right? You know, uh, randomly selecting 20,000 Americans and having just them vote. Right? Think of the statistical error rate. And now think about what would happen if literally all 220 million Americans eligible to vote voted. And think about the counting error. The counting error for 220 million voters is higher than the, the predicted error for 20,000 people. So even if you just want to get a good representative outcome, randomly selecting 20,000 people is better than literally having everybody vote. And that's before you take into account just the massive opportunity cost of time of hundreds of millions of people voting versus 20,000. So I think, I think having representative government, despite what I've said, is a good thing overall, but there might be better ways of doing it. Yeah, go ahead. So you're making an argument against democracy, but you're not coming out and saying it exactly. Saying what? Is that right? You're making an argument against democracy, but you're not coming out and saying it exactly. Am I understanding this correctly? No, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends on what you mean again. It's a different problem. For the purpose of this paper, it's just like this effective altruist argument doesn't work. Uh, whether what I've said counts as anti-democratic or not also depends on how you use the word democratic. It's one of those, you know, are there any political theorists here? It's most essentially contested concepts. So someone like me or Alex Guerrero or Claudia Lopez Guerra, we're like sortition, lottery-based systems. That's democracy, because what is democracy? Everybody has fundamentally equal power. If we randomly select people, we literally randomly select them, and they and only they get to vote, everyone has equal power. And then the system that determines that you get to be an elector, you get the office of elector, is random. So we're all equal. That's perfectly democratic. Other people are like, no, 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 it only counts as democratic if everyone participates. What's the right use of the word democracy? Again, essentially contested. So I, I think, despite calling it against democracy, I think at the end of the day, I qualify as a Democrat, just a weird one. Um, but I'm also happy for people to be like, you're not a real Democrat, you're something else. So, yeah. So can I just follow up? Yes, please. Because this discussion is reminding me of the electric car discussion, where we consider it a positive externality, I mean, for the police, so it's a public good to buy an electric car. So there's an economics paper where they looked at, um, you know, once you realize that you have to kind of charge it, uh, that uh, throws a bit of a monkey wrench into the calculation, and they split the country into two portions. This is where the portion of the country that should you should subsidize um, electric cars, but here's where you should tax them because it's, it's a gray area, right? Depending right. on where you're charging the where is where it's coming from, and so if uh, if you're gonna go uh, the the length to say it's like not everybody should vote and it's like it just should be a lottery system, would you go the second next step to say it should be a tax subsidy type of thing? Where Brian Kaplan used to say, you vote if you can actually tell me what is the quadratic formula is. So some sort of a test where if you pass that and you say, okay, informed, you get subsidized to vote versus if not, you get taxed to vote. Yeah. I'm in principle, I'm in principle okay with that if that works. My view about government is 
our, our job with government is to realize justice. We don't get to decide what justice is. There's some truth in the matter. My view is like moral nihilism makes sense and objectivism makes sense and everything in between is, is nonsense. But I mean, it's either there's no morality or it's morality. There's nothing, nothing else. Uh, and in principle, my view would be if that works better than the alternatives, we should take it. Like that, my, my view of government is whatever system does the best job of delivering justice or defined broad, all things considered, is what we should have. So if that were, if that turns out to be the most effective system, I'd be okay with it. I don't have any inherent problem with the idea of like taxing the externality. Of your vote. I, I agree. Like uh, I think one of my papers was called "Polluting the Polls." So I literally use that metaphor of like you are imposing a harm upon a third party. Like you know, you should have the right to decide for yourself. But you're imposing a harm upon a third party. Um, whether that would be more effective than some other alternatives, including problems. Like what, well, again, I like, my idea that I'd like to try would be everyone gets to vote. Um, when you vote, you tell us who you are, what you know, and what you want. We then statistically estimate what the demographic identical public would have wanted had it gotten a perfect score on our test. And then we do that instead, right? That's palatable because at the end of the day, there, it's not, some people like, I call it epistocracy, but some people say it's really democracy. They're like, no, you know, it's not really the case that you had 4.7 votes and I only had 3.2 and you had 1.1 and you had a whopping 90 votes. It's just, we all have equal input into this black box kind of system and the black box turns out an answer and that's what we do. So is that democracy? I think it kind of is. I can see people saying it's not, but I can also say that it is. And uh, it will avoid the problem of like, people worrying about poll taxes or things like that. It would avoid like demographic disparities in knowledge and that having an impact on people's resistance or acceptance of government. So, but yeah, in principle, if that, if someone, if, if, if you know, a supercomputer that knows everything appeared before me and said, the thing you just suggested, that does the best job delivering justice and everything else, I'd be like, decisive, I'm not here. Right? For me, all I care about is the outcomes. I don't care about the, the form of government itself. Right, so yes, in the back. Okay. So, in the test algebra, I don't know what you are and what you want, but there's also a good analogy. Yeah. So, this is an obvious question, but two parts of it. What kinds of things are on the novel test that you make? Great question. Yeah. And so by the way, now that we're talking about this, remember, this goes beyond this paper. So if everything I've said <laughs> in the last three questions is stupid, at least doesn't make this, this paper can be stupid for other reasons. <laughs> um, here's what I'm saying about that in the, in the book against democracy. I actually like to recommend having democracy decide what goes on the test, which sounds weird because didn't I just say they're dumb? But here's the thing, like, I actually try this. I asked my kid who's now 10 when he was like five, what does it take to make a good spouse? And he gave me a really good theory. He's never dated anybody, has no experience with that. You know, but as a five-year-old, he knew in the abstract what it is to be a good spouse. Would I think he's competent to pick a spouse? Absolutely not. We wouldn't have a five-year-old pick that. Oddly, when you ask voters, what should you know to be a good voter? They give really smart answers to that question, but they don't know the answers. They get, so the, the answer to that question is certain questions. These are the questions you should know the answer to to vote well. They give really smart answers to what you should know. And then if you ask them, well, do you know any of those things? They don't know. Right. So they would say things like, one of the things you should know is which party controls Congress. Most Americans don't know that, but they think they should. You should know who your particular candidate is. I mean, you're saying, who your particular representative in Congress is. Most people don't know that, but they know they should. You should know like some of the stuff that, con that has happened in the past few years. They don't know that, but they know they should know it. You should know um, uh, like some effects of these things and others. So what I'd like to do is, if I, if I got my chance to actually run this, you know, the enlightened preference voting model, what I do is randomly select, say, 500 Americans and pay them like a thousand bucks or in, in plus expenses to come together at a Hilton some weekend. And I say, you guys are now charged with picking, you are going to write the knowledge test for Americans. Remember, this test doesn't determine whether or not you get to vote. Everyone gets to vote equally on this. It's just used to weigh, to statistically weigh or assess the outcomes afterwards. You put any questions you want. You get 40 questions, anything you want, or 30 questions, anything you want. It could include the price of milk or the cost of daycare or like whether you think, you know, the winds of winter will ever be released. Whatever you want, you put that on there as long as there's a yes or no answer. So then we can look up clear, clear objective truth of the matter. And then they write the test and then we give that to the Americans as a whole and they are the ones to take it. 
I think they'd come up with a really good test, even though most of the people in the room don't know the answers to the questions on the test. They kind of, they're kind of like, uh, you never have students who, you know, you're giving them like the calculus 101 final, and they kind of know they're coming, they're like, yeah, I'm supposed to know what this symbol means. I don't, but I know I'm supposed to know. I know there is the symbol, and I know I'm supposed to know what to do with it. That's kind of what Americans are like. They're like, I, I should know who my congressperson is. Who's your congressperson? Which party? I'm not sure. Right. But they know they should know that stuff. And the other things I might throw on there that are not what we might call core political knowledge, like the price of milk or the cost of daycare. That's reasonable stuff to worry about too. And if that's what they want to put on it, I'd love it. So oh, those candidates some of the answers. That's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let, let democracy decide what goes on the test, which is then used in the weighing for the enlightened preference model. That's what I would do if I had a chance. I think it would work pretty well. But I might be wrong. No one's like no one's giving me a country to try this out on. I can't get funding for that experiment. All right, let's have Jason's deadline. Thank you. Thank you.